Welcome back, my Freedom Pack family. Today on the show, we are speaking to best-selling author, Dr. Jessamy Hibbard. Jessamy is a London-based clinical psychologist, and I was absolutely delighted to sit down with her and to try and tackle the subject of imposter syndrome. Jessamy is a TEDx speaker, an active consultant and spokeswoman. If you tune into things like LBC or Woman's Hour regularly, you'll have more than likely have heard of Jessamy. You'll probably have heard her speak. Alternatively, you may also have read some of her work, which was featured in major publications like The Guardian, like The Telegraph, and... As this episode goes on, you will realise that if, personally, I ever need a therapist, I will most definitely be going to see Dr. Jessamy, because she's just such a hugely impressive individual, and, and I love the way in which she articulates her ideas. So, one of the reasons why I wanted to try to tackle this subject is have you ever been in a social or skilled setting and you've looked around and you've thought I don't belong here I'm not as good as they think I am I've got lucky if you said yes to any of those things then that's likely that it's imposter syndrome it is a hugely prevalent subject Something I myself have faced and this is why I was so happy to discuss it with Jess and me. We, on this show, we want to bring light to things which there's not much light. (laughs) We want to try to tackle difficult subjects. We want to give you the habits, the self-talk, the tactics to take your life forward. And if you've ever suffered with imposter syndrome, then I can guarantee you that this episode will be of value to you. So, in this episode, we look at what it is, where imposter syndrome comes from, strategies, tactics, self-talk, all the usual, different ideas for how to deal with it. And if you'd like more information on this, Jess and me does have a fantastic book on this called The Imposter Cure, which you can pick a copy up from Amazon, which will be linked below should you wish. And yeah, so I won't drag this on any further. Uh, before we jump into it, the only thing we ask of you guys is if you enjoy our work, please leave us a rating and a review. It helps us so much with the visibility of the show and we really appreciate it. Dr. Jessamy Hibbard, welcome to the Freedom Pact. Thanks, Jay. So if I was to go onto Instagram right now and type the word imposter in, I would see 58,000 posts related to it. Imposter syndrome actually has over 30,000 posts related to it. My question to you would be, despite these huge figures, how many people out there would you say suffer from imposter syndrome but don't actually know the specific term? I think that it's definitely becoming more mainstream. And even in the last year since I started writing the book, I've noticed how much more commonly it's used as a term and to kind of describe how people are feeling. But I think you're right. There's still a lot of people out there who haven't got a name for it but feel like they're going to be found out or they're not doing well enough at work and there's still you know if you think about the statistics it it, it shows that 70 percent will experience imposter syndrome and I think probably it, it could be even higher than that because it's something that we all experience at different times it's some, certainly something I can identify with when I told people about the book the most common response was oh, I think I've got that so so yeah I think it's really prevalent I was speaking to my my mother about it. I was speaking to some friends about it, and they were like, "I get that. 
because the book it comes with this card and do you feel as if you were lucky and and are you worried that people are gonna find out and things and i said it to them and they were like oh, yes yeah. like that's that's exactly like like how i'm feeling what do you yeah. think the the benefit of actually labeling giving something that label i think it just helps you to see it more and i think the label also lets you realize that it's not just you so when people said to me, I think I've got that, they were also wanting to know, is it normal? You know, like, does everybody else have it too? Because no one's quite sure whether they're the only one or whether this is something that's really common. And with a label, it means that you can see what it is and then you've got more options to change it. And um, in the book, for example, I talk about trying to externalise that voice that says you're no good or you were just lucky or it was a fluke this time and next time it's going to all go wrong. And when you start to see the voice in action, rather than kind of completely believing it, it gives you a chance to question it and to start to bring in kind of new ways of thinking about yourself. How would you actually define imposter syndrome? So the definition, it's feeling that you're not as good as everybody else thinks you are and that you're not up to the same standard that people believe you to be. And I suppose just from thinking about it for the book, I've I've, wind, I've widened the definition a bit because for me, I think it's much more than feeling fraudulent. And that's why I think some people can identify with it without necessarily seeing that they're an imposter or knowing it before they read the book. Because it's things like insecurity, self-doubt, fear of failure, perfectionism, self-criticism, low self-esteem. It's also the fact that you can't internalise your success. So no matter how well you do, you know, unlike low confidence where you could work really hard and kind of see your success and then gain confidence imposter syndrome you don't internalize that success so you never feel any better even when you've done a good project and so that's things like not being able to accept compliments a kind of constant focus on where you're falling short and for some people it feels like you know a guard against arrogance and like a safety net in case things go wrong as if if they get too big for their boots or they kind of think they're too good and then something bad happens or people don't think they're as good as they thought they were it would be better just to never get excited about it you know and never to believe that it would be safer almost you were a clinical psychologist so i'm just wondering what are some of the major themes that people come to you with is it i'm worried yeah. that they're going to find out i'm not as good as I, as I seem to be that my success was a fluke is it that type of thing yeah for the work that i do if you think about imposter syndrome i'd say it's on a continuum so some people feel it a lot of the time and some people just feel it occasionally in certain situations. And for the people that I see, it's often tied up with other issues. So um, they might be very anxious in their work and then the more you talk about it, you realise that actually it's because they don't feel like they're any good at what they do. And when you're working on it, again, this kind of difference between is it low self-esteem or is it imposter syndrome? Well, if you think you're going to do badly on a work task and then it goes really well or if you think that I don't know you won't be invited to a party but actually you are invited then for people with low confidence they just update their belief and they think okay actually I'm better than I thought or you know it didn't go the the way I expected and that's a good thing whereas for imposters their conclusion is oh I fooled them again you know or oh how long can I keep this up for and so the the people that I tend to see it on a on a bigger scale and it's the belief that they're an imposter or that they're not good enough is really entrenched and probably I see it more in terms of a belief of not being good enough um, as the primary reason they come and see me and then as you start to kind of delve into it there's lots of kind of imposter fears involved in that too. It's just crazy because I'm really friends with this girl and uh, she is she's also a psychology student and she just finished a placement here, and she's she's such a brilliant person. She's so switched on, and and she's achieved so much. And I speak to her, and she kept saying to me, she was like, "Oh, they are gonna find out that that I'm not as good as they think I am, and I'm gonna be found out that I'm not this great girlfriend." And and this, and and she kept saying it to me a long ago before I, before I really knew about the term, and I was yeah. like. Who's they? <laughs> I was like, I was like <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, so I think this brings on because I know that that she is just such a brilliant person, and that she she just seems like like whatever she wants to, she can just do her effortlessly. So 
I think that this this is a huge point about imposter syndrome, and you talk about this in the book that it doesn't discriminate. Yeah, it, it, it has a very wide spectrum of of who it can impact. And for the listeners that are listening, podcasting in front of thousands every week, and even I feel this. I felt this on on Sunday, so yeah. I can app. So it it absolutely doesn't discriminate, does it? No, it doesn't discriminate. And I think originally it was thought of as this kind of select group of high achieving women. But the more the area has been researched and the more people are talking about it, we see just as you say that it, it doesn't discriminate at all. It can fe- affect anybody. Um, and generally it's that stepping outside of your comfort zone. So say starting a new job or doing something that's slightly kind of new to you, or it, you could be in the same job or kind of, you know, amongst the same group of friends or in your same relationship, but you don't see yourself as what they see you as. So there's a discrepancy between the person you believe yourself to be and what other people think think you are. And you don't think they're as, you're as good as what they think you are. So there's this mismatch in beliefs. And I think, that I suppose, in terms of that belief, the biggest problem is that you've got this faulty belief that you're an imposter, that there's, you know, a problem with you or you're not good enough or that other people, if they knew the truth, would see you very differently. And the belief is kind of so set, set that you only pay attention to information that matches it. So you go through life building on that belief and paying attention to everything that fits your view, but managing to ignore all the information that doesn't fit. And again, it stops you from kind of internalising that new view and seeing yourself differently. Does this affect women more than men? I mean, I don't know the exact statistics, but I would say that it affects both men and women. I don't know exactly the proportion to each. I think that for men, it's something that's harder to speak up about. And even in terms of kind of society and our expectations of how men should be, that they should be strong and not worry and be very capable and competent. And so it makes it very difficult to open up about those things. But a lot of high achieving men experience this. And like you said, you know, even though your job, you're used to speaking in front of people, you still get those feelings come in. So, so it's not it's not a gender thing. Mm. So, does risk taking in any way does risk taking help someone overcome it? So, I'm just thinking because a lot of the women I spoke to before this, they they were all like, yeah, 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 and then it was a lesser proportion of men. Although I am fully aware that that is a completely, you know, that's that's not a fair study or a sample size. Yeah, I was going to say, and also, are they telling you the truth? So are they admitting mm. to it? For men, it's much harder to admit to these things and um, to talk openly about something like that because it, it, I think still men are a bit further behind in terms of being able to talk openly about mental health. Yeah, I agree. I think I think that's that's definitely true. No, I was I was just thinking, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I interrupted you. But I no, suppose please, in please, terms please. of <laughs> another, I suppose if I think along the lines you're thinking, there's also you're also more likely to experience it when you're not the dominant group. So you feel, when you feel different to the dominant group. So I suppose in terms of you know a lot of corporate working environments still, for example, they're still very male dominated, and particularly the higher up you go, the less women there are. So I in in those situations, there's more room to feel like an imposter if you don't feel like you belong. Um, and so perhaps perhaps there's a truth to what you're saying. Mm, that this is interesting because if I was the only woman in a male dominated organization, then I I suppose there is more pressure implicitly on me, and I wouldn't be comparing myself to say the lowest performing man. You'd be looking mm-hmm. higher up. The not it's not one versus say twelve. It's it's like you have to compare yourself to the top and sort of the mean. So I completely get that. That's really interesting. And that often you feel like you've got to perform for yourself, but also for the group that you're part of, whether it's your gender or ethnicity or sexual orientation or, you know, something else that sets you as different within the group that you're part of. So it's like a double kind of whammy in terms of how you've got to perform on those Mm. two levels. You talked about this confirmation bias where you look at confirmation bias is when we sort of disregard a lot of other information and we just focus on the information which seems relevant to whatever our belief is and beliefs are turbocharged by emotion. 
So how big yeah. of, a, of an impact does that confirmation bias have in imposter syndrome? That it has a huge impact. And um, I think that we can all relate to it in terms of, you know, when you're in an argument and you've got your own point of view and it's really difficult to listen to the other person's point of view or when you support a sports team you're really passionate about or a political party, you, you don't look at the other teams or the other political party and think about what's good about them. You just build all the time this idea of what's good about the thing that you're supporting. And it's the same with imposter syndrome. This kind of belief completely shapes your view. And the, the thing is, that's, that's not all bad. We need to have some kind of mental system that allows us to um, simplify the world around us. So if we just had to work everything out from scratch, you know, we wouldn't get anywhere from brushing your teeth or knowing the way to work. You know, we've got to kind of find ways and shortcuts. And so beliefs do help to simplify the world and they help you kind of think and learn quickly. But the trouble is that if, it's, if the belief is faulty to begin with, then, then you're building on that and it almost becomes like a well-worn path. It's really easy to go down that well-worn path. You know it really well, you trust in it. And the idea of kind of thinking differently means carving out a new route and that's, that's difficult to do, but also you've got to want to do it. And if you're really scared that you're an imposter, the idea of doing that is, you know, terrifying because you wouldn't want to be found out. You've got to have some faith that you might be wrong before you can start to take a different approach. So what type of things would feed into this confirmation bias? I guess thinking about it in a work sense is easier. Say you're working on a project, you're sure that it's not very good, you know, you've worked really hard on it, but you just have this feeling that they're going to read it and think it's, you know, that what on earth have you given them? And then your boss gets it and says, oh, this was brilliant. And I'm really pleased with it. And you think you either, you know, go, well, it's just because I worked really hard on it. If I hadn't put so much work into it, I wouldn't have done so well or next time I won't be able to do it or God, I was just lucky that time. And so you have this kind of library of responses that dismiss or kind of credit other people as the reason that you've done all right. And at the times when you do, you know, get some constructive criticism, you kind of hold on to that and go over and over and over it. So the time that you give to the things you're unhappy with is disproportionately greater than the time you give to the things you're pleased with. And even that kind of sense of relief you get when it's okay you know, I got away with it, it's so short-lived because then you're just thinking ahead, oh, now I've got further to fall or what happens next time. The thing which I found really interesting was when I have asked a, a small study of people, the people that openly identified to saying, I have or I resonate with imposter syndrome were the ones which... I suppose, from a, say, an academic point of view, just had these outstanding achievements. They, yeah. They had really, really achieved so much. And it sort of made me think that, given how imposter syndrome is, that they more likely had the attitude of that their successes were external to them, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. I think that um, the more that you achieve, there's, there's a part of you that kind of, you know, you've got to have achieved something to worry that you're going to lose it, if that makes sense. So if you're doing really well, it, it's it, in some ways it's more likely that you're going to get it because you are more visible. And in terms of that kind of external, you know, sense that it's because of what other people are doing or because of some luck or because you've just been in the right place at the right time, again, that's what makes it so hard for you to take it on board yourself. And I think the better you do, sometimes people say to me, you know, well, now I've got even further to fall. So sometimes the argument even changes from I can't do this to, oh, well, I can do it, but how long can I keep going for? And that's the thing about imposter syndrome, the argument's constantly changing, which, again, I think is an alarm bell, because if you're so sure, surely it's just one argument. It doesn't need to change to fit whatever you're doing in that, and yet it's constantly changing. Um, and the other way I think about it is because about this idea, it's almost like having a prejudice against yourself. You're so sure of it that you're building all the time on this belief without listening to any other information. And um, it means that it's very, very difficult to see a different view. Yeah, it's just so crazy that when you just think about it logically, that someone can achieve so much and then that they can just say, oh, this, this all these successes over here, this vast array of successes that's not my doing 
you know, yeah. or, or there's a number yeah. of reasons. But this tiny little, for this, for this tiny little strata of of failures, this this is completely my fault. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And and that's what when you look at it like that, and you start to get it out in the open, it's so it's good because you can laugh at it, and you can start to say, look, how is this? And even sometimes people will say to me, say, I get them to do a CV of what they've done. They say, well, it just looks good on paper. It's like, no, it looks good because it is good. And just finding ways to connect with it more because it's like there's a disconnect between everything you've done and what you see of yourself. And again, it's this kind of idea that, oh, I, you know, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to tell people about how I'm doing because if I actually muck up, then it'll be far more embarrassing or it'll be far further to fall. And I think for some people, they do have glimpses of it. So they have periods where they kind of think, oh, I'm doing really well. You know, actually, I can see I'm all right at this. And then something comes in where they're unsure of themselves again. And because of the strength of this belief, it kind of all piles back in on them again. Is it just one event which can cause someone to develop imposter syndrome? Or is it a case of early childhood experiences? How does it actually come about? How does it breed? I think it's generally more than one one experience of something. So with most people, it does have its origins in childhood. And there's the kind of nature-nurture ideas of how you're born. So definitely temperament plays a part. And so if you're a more of a more anxious disposition, then you're more prone to kind of seeing the world differently and more in a more threatening way. But also in terms of your upbringing, Often if you've had very mixed messages when you're growing up, so say, you know, school says you're doing well, but at home your parents are saying, well, why aren't you getting a higher grade? And this isn't good enough. And so you're not quite sure how you're doing. School says it's good, but home says it's not so good. And these mixed messages. But also when you're kind of labelled as a child, so for example, there's, you know, like in a family, someone's the clever one. If you're not the clever one, what does that make you? And even if you're labelled the clever one, then that can bring an added pressure. Oh, I meant to be the clever one. I should find things easy. If I can't find things easy, that means I'm not actually clever and they've got me wrong. And so the sort of labels that are put on you can make a big difference, um, particularly when you're compared to others. Um, and I think also the definition of success in your family. So if there's an idea that, you know, someone who's really bright, things come easily to them and they, that you shouldn't have to work too hard to do well, again, it can make you question yourself. And the reality is that it's hard work that brings about success for anybody and that nobody kind of finds things easy or is a natural at, at things. But if you say as a child found things really easy and then you get to a level where things become more difficult, it can make you start to question yourself. And I think that, you know, how, how your parent definitely has an impact, but it's not about blaming your parents. It's seeing that they were human too and they were parented in a certain way. And on the whole, they're probably doing their best and wanting the best for you, but sometimes it can come out in a way that makes you feel not good enough or see yourself as um, kind of not up to things in the same way as other people. I think this is such a hugely important point. And I remember one time I had just come back from university and I told a family member that in one assignment I did, I had, I think it was like, say, so we'll say like 72%. Now, in yeah. university terms, that's that's a first class uh, yeah, classification. Yeah, brilliant. So, and I told them they were like, "Oh yeah, but like, where's the other twenty eight percent?" And I'm just sitting, yeah. and like, I think that just like feeds into your point because, especially if someone hasn't been to university, then it's impossible yeah. for them yeah. to possibly know. Yeah, for some people, it can even be kind of flyaway comments. So that person probably didn't think much of saying that to you, and yet it sticks in your mind or. You know, I teach saying, oh, you'll never be as you never be as quick as your sister or the kind of <laughs> comments that are seen as insignificant by the person giving them, but are really taken on board and held, you know, when you hear it. I, and all yeah. of those things shape your view. Yeah, I, I think as well that, that like in my experience, I think I think that they've been tried to use as some sort of like motivational device to try to yeah. push me further but but yeah. I, I like like i mean you, you talk about like like that can have a completely detrimental effect yeah and that it can be very demotivating 
And if you think about when you're younger, particularly, you know, under 10, your beliefs about the world are completely informed by the people closest to you. So you can't, you know, you, do, you don't know that all families are different. You don't have access to information that can tell you, you know, whether your parents are right or wrong. You can't Google something. How your parents or the people closest to you tell you the world is, in your mind, is how the world is. So those early beliefs are set in this really strong way. And then, you know, like we've been talking about already, you build upon those beliefs. And then the second part of that is that you build strategies to manage and cope in the world based on those beliefs. So if the beliefs are wrong at the start, then your coping strategies are probably hindering you rather than helping you. And they're set more strongly so you're collecting that information that fits with them and finding it much harder to believe a different view. And those beliefs and what people tell you are set about, you know, how you think the world is, what you expect of yourself and also what you expect of other people. And so that's why those early years can have such an impact. Um, and that's why it's so important to kind of understand where it comes from so that you can step back from it. And it's a chance to reevaluate, you know, with most things in life, we have a view and then we update it with kind of new information and we look at things more fairly. It shouldn't really be any different with yourself. You get to a certain point in your life, if it's not working, you have a good look at it and think, okay, well, what's not working here? What can I do differently? And what, what conclusions might have I have come to that are causing me problems now? I always like to think of our self-talk as sort of the the operating system which which the computer is running on and if beliefs uh self-talk habit if these things they aren't helpful then let's update the software <laughs> uh, i like it are you familiar with Brene brown at all jessamy yes I Have think you... it's hard not to be. She's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I recently, it was only, I'm so annoyed. It was only this year that, that I came on to, to Brene's work and I read Daring Greatly and I thought it was absolutely fantastic. I thought it was a great book. And uh, yeah. I, I, when, I, when I read your book and, and I read about perfectionism in there, and it seems to be like psychologists, they really don't like this perfectionism. <laughs> no. I'm just wondering, perfectionism, do, do you sort of have the same findings as Brene where she talks about how perfectionism is not a strength and that if you dig deep into it, that it's actually rooted in things like shame, people pleasing, that type of stuff? Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm in complete agreement and she's done some amazing research and she also has a wonderful way of sharing the research, you know, in such a such a brilliant way. But I think that people confuse working really hard, which which can be a good thing, with perfectionism. And I've got nothing against working really hard, but when you're aiming for perfect and you want to do everything perfectly, it means you're always gonna fall short because there's there's nothing in life that you can do perfectly. You know, there's always something that will stop you being 100% because it just doesn't exist. And so when you're focusing on perfection, it actually means you're focusing on what where you're falling short or anything that you're unhappy with. And then it and, and if you think about the reason for wanting to do things perfectly, it's to kind of feel really good about yourself and know how capable you are. And yet again, it does the opposite of that. It completely undermines all of those things and makes it really difficult to enjoy the things that you're doing. And and in terms of where it comes from, yeah, I completely agree. It's almost um, the root of it being in shame and not feeling good enough and as a way to correct those things. And actually it feeds into the problem, so it's really corrosive. So how does perfectionism breed into imposter syndrome? If you think about the idea that your standards that you hold for yourself are much higher than the standards that you hold for anybody else or what anybody else expects of you, then if you're aiming for perfect or you're aiming for perfection and you're not reaching that standard, each time you're saying, well, I'm not, I'm, I'm definitely not good at this job then or I'm not good enough. And so again, it's kind of this disparity between what, what you think you are and what everybody else thinks. And yet nobody else has those same standards for you. You know, if you think again in a work sense, you're working really long hours producing these kind of incredible reports, but actually they just need, you know, they don't need it to be that amazing. They just need some information on the topic. And it's and again, it's this kind of mismatch between what you expect of yourself and what others expect. 
and this idea that you feel like you're falling short. A lot of these different confidence styles, which we'll get on to shortly, is reinforced by self-criticism. And yeah. I'd love to ask, is self-criticism ever a useful tool? No, it's never a useful tool. I think that, again, people feel like, oh, well, you know, if I never pick up on my faults, then I'm just going to get lazy or I'm not going to, you know, take life seriously enough. Um, or I'm going to kind of slack off and not do as well as I've always done. Whereas actually, you can look at where you need to improve without doing it in a critical way. And in, and I often think about it in terms of, you know, like if you had a trainer, a personal trainer, would you want somebody who shouted at you and told you how useless you were and how, you know, badly you were doing and that you were never going to get there? Or would you rather have someone who looked at the good stuff you're doing, found ways to kind of build that into other areas of your life, and also looked at, the bits you're falling short on in a more compassionate way as a way to kind of think about why it's happening and how to improve on it. You know, there's no way you'd want to be shouted at every day, or I certainly wouldn't. And yet that's what self-criticism is. And so the alternative of no self-criticism isn't ignoring all your faults. It's looking at them in a kind of more compassionate way so that you can work out how to improve and move forward. I know Brene gives the examples of the difference between guilt and shame. Whereas guilt is, I did bad. Shame is, I am bad. Yeah. Is that something we should look at? We should not label ourselves, but label the, the actions? Yeah. And um, I think keeping it specific. So rather than, you know, I mucked up, meaning, you know, on everything, making it specific about okay I mucked up on that project or I mucked up with that friend this time but actually in the past that's not how it's been and when you make it specific it gives you a pathway that you can make a change and do something about it whereas when it's global and it you feel like it's just who you are and the person you are it's much more paralyzing and it's harder to think about ever being able to do things differently and I think very early on in my life I really suffered I think with black and white thinking and I think this sort of may breed into perfectionism I remember yeah. I, I I bought a um a a DBT workbook a dialectical behavioral therapy book off uh off Amazon and, yeah. and it was like it was like six part and it was absolutely brilliant and do you still do you still do psychologists actually practice DBT is that a thing yeah they do yeah uh, yeah what, what a fantastic tool like a, a dialectic very few things are black and white. There's so much grey area in everything. You know, there's so much is perception. Is that yeah. a tool which people could use if they are suffering with perfectionism? Yeah, definitely. And I think that in a way, you almost need that black and white thinking when you're younger. You know, it makes the word world more simple and your thinking is not complex enough really to understand those shades of grey, particularly when you're very young. And then as you get older, it's starting to see the context of things and how, depending on the context, it can completely change um, your interpretation of why something happened or what went on. And I think in terms of that kind of black and white thinking in, when it comes to perfectionism, it's really important to have the shades of grey in between. And also to find, because I suppose something that's sometimes overlooked in perfectionism is that the person doesn't see it as all bad, not just because they want to do things perfectly, but also because they get a thrill from working that hard and, you know, believing that they can get it perfect. And there are good periods within there too. That's what kind of keeps the pull of it, that you can do really well. And when you get good feedback, that kind of reinforces it. And so starting to bring in almost kind of different shades of what what you need to be doing and where you can be on that spectrum and also bringing in almost different gears to how you work so that you can work really hard on certain projects where you really care about them, but to try and work hard on every area of your life all of the time is, is you know, just not possible or sustainable in the long term. And so I think it can be in different ways that you look at it. When I spoke to some people regarding this and we talked about, you know, this idea of perfectionism, the feedback which I had was, that people in general viewed it as a strength. I definitely made links. I didn't say it, but I definitely made links yeah. between the people that I spoke to that identified with perfectionism and also this tendency that you talked about in avoidance. 
So really yeah. delaying the process to get started. Could you sort of link those two ideas together? Yeah. So I suppose in terms of particularly with imposter syndrome, that lots of people swing between this kind of really overworking and perfectionism and then avoidance, so procrastinating and completely not doing what they're meant to be doing. And if you think about how high your standards are, then it can feel really hard to get going sometimes. And the idea that you've got to do it perfectly and get on with it, particularly if you're not feeling very good about yourself, can feel so overwhelming that you just don't do it. And so you, you know, procrastinate, check your emails, put on a wash, do anything else that needs doing because it's easier to do that and then, then face up to this kind of what feels like a overwhelming challenge. And that's why people often end up putting it off, putting it off, and then having kind of a last minute flurry to trying to do the task when they've got all that kind of pressure weighted on them. But it's but but like you've identified, it's really common to have the two together. So is the answer to overcoming avoidance and overworking, is it boundaries that we set for ourselves? I think that a mistake that a lot of people make is that they say, you know, I'm just going to wait till I feel like doing it. And the trouble is that there's never a time when you feel like doing it particularly when it's something that's going to be difficult to do. Um, and I think that the other thing is to almost set it up in a way that gives you the reward after it. So people say, well, I'll just do this first and then I'll check it. You know, then I'll, then I'll try and do the piece of work. Whereas if you switch it around and say, okay, I'm just going to start and do half an hour on this and see where I get to. And then I'm going to reward myself by, you know, checking my emails or making myself a cup of coffee or you know, doing something nice then you've got the, you've started it and starting it is often the hardest bit. And another simple thing that I think can be really effective is when you, when you're putting, when you're kind of putting off doing something and you're procrastinating, it's trying to get away from feeling bad, but actually putting it off makes you feel even worse. So you're stuck with that feeling. It's kind of with you for even longer. And so what I try and get people to do is connect to their future self, which might fa- sound a bit strange, but it's just connecting to how you'll feel after you've done it, you know, the reason you're doing it and where it will get you and having a kind of look ahead to how much better it will be when you've done it and how much more you'll gain from it just by doing it so that you're not thinking about how you're feeling right now and you're kind of looking at the long-term view. Something I would say and the and that I definitely got from your book. And I think this may be one of the most helpful tactics that I've got from a book in a long time, is that when you feel these imposter syndrome symptoms kick in, like the perfectionism, the avoidance, the overwork, and all these different things, when that kicks in, to give that voice in your head a different tonality, a different pitch, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're almost giving the imposter a voice of his own so you can identify. I thought that was absolutely brilliant. What yeah. impact can that have? I think it just really helps you see it more. And so when it's part of your normal commentary, you know, and running through your head as a normal part of your day, you're just accepting that as your thoughts and what you think. And what I try and kind of make really clear in the book is that although your thoughts and feelings are really important, they're not always facts. And so when it comes to that discomfort, lots of people experience, they, you know, and then they kind of are feeling anxious or nervous about something. An imposter will interpret that as I must be an imposter or I'm not up to the task. And instead, recognizing that actually everybody feels like that. Even the most confident people, when they're doing something that's out of their comfort zone, they feel that discomfort. And the same for your thoughts. So with externalizing the thoughts and seeing, okay, this is the imposter talking it's much easier to say, okay, I don't want to listen to this voice. And and the better you get at that, the easier it becomes to dismiss dismiss what's being said and kind of override it. And it's not really that you'll never get those thoughts because, you know, we all get those thoughts. We all have times when we're like, oh, am I going to be able to do this? You know, can I, can I do what I've said I'll do? And actually, it's just knowing that that's normal. And when you see the voice, it's not got, it hasn't got your best interest. You can go against it and do what's best for you. Something I loved that you said but there was facts are not feelings. Why should I be wary of my feelings? And also, how can I distinguish between the two? 
I think that when it comes to imposter syndrome, there's a lot of fear. And so that means that you're almost kind of drowned in the anxiety emotion. And if you think back to our origins, then we had to be primed for survival. And that meant um, having this fight or flight response. So if you saw danger, you had this kind of better safe than sorry approach. If, if you thought there's danger, then you've got to kind of run or fight. And, and um, that response is still in us now. So even when it's not a tiger or, can, you know, something jumping out at you, even when it's something like not feeling you're good enough at work, you still get that fight or flight response. And so it's really hard to think in the same way because when you're feeling very anxious, it changes how you think. And I suppose our emotions are so important and we do need to pay attention to them and listen to them. But it's also bringing in the thoughts that go with it your, and your experiences as well. So, for example, if you're really worried about, um, you know, say you've got a speaking gig and you've got to stand up in front of loads of people and you're really worried about it there's a part of it that's sensible in terms of okay you want to prepare really well you want to um, do a good job but to think that you can't do it or it's all going to go wrong that's really unhelpful and that's where it's helpful to bring in your experience of thinking about um, your skills for the job why whether you've done it before and it's gone okay and to kind of bring in this fuller picture and I think that, again, by noticing the pattern and the way that kind of imposter syndrome plays out in your life, you can be more alert to those beliefs that are not helpful and start to challenge them. Could you link this in with our idea, which you talked about in the book, which I thought was brilliant, about the race runner saying, I'm going to win this race? Yeah. Could, <laughs> yeah. You, could you talk about that? Yeah. Um, so in the book, I talk about, imagine if somebody said to you, you know, I'm definitely going to win this race. And um, there's, a, there's, say, 10 people running the race. You, you wouldn't just completely believe that person because they say they're definitely going to win it. You'd also want to know about what their coach thinks. You'd want to look at their previous form and see how they've done in other races. Um, and you'd want to know who else was racing that day and what they're like. And it's the same for us, you know, when we, when we think about something. I can't do this, you know, almost the opposite. It's thinking, okay, well, what's my experience to date? And that's the thing when you have imposter syndrome, you're not so good at looking about at all the things you've done so far. And it's actually having a different view of your life and taking on board everything, not just the things you're unhappy with. And so a bit like being seeded, you know, for a race or in a tennis match, you wouldn't just look at how you're feeling right now. You'd look at all the information and all the experience that goes with it to, to have a more real view of how you might do. If we're looking at, say, the cure, should we be thinking about our successes more? Definitely. And I think that's the trouble that most people who experience this don't think about their successes at all. It's almost like, oh, that's going to be bad luck. Or, you know, like if I look at that too much, then I'm definitely going to go wrong next time. And again, it's coming back to that idea of connecting to it more so that you're aware of all that you've done, that you're really taking it on board that you're thinking about it, that you're talking about it, that you can see examples of it in your life, so that you're building this new view based on facts rather than a feeling or your thoughts about yourself. Um, and by starting to kind of see all of yourself rather than what you're unhappy with, it gives you a far fairer view of yourself and it also builds your confidence to see that you can do it and to see what you really are capable of. And I think the other part of that is also seeing that, you know, we almost have this idea in our head, well, we're, we're not good enough or we're not capable, but everybody else is and they've got it all together. And I think the other side of it is just recognising that all of these feelings we experience from, you know, worrying about failing or feeling we're not good enough or feeling insecure or having self-doubt, just how human that is. And that's not a sign that you're not doing well. That's just a sign that you care and you want to do well. And that's something, you know, that is something that lots of people experience and is part of being human rather than a problem. So it's looking at it on those different levels to make a change. It doesn't just have to be a huge macro success. It could be a micro one. Something that I do is I have my to-do list and then I have a completed list on the next page. And then as yeah. soon as I do one thing, I really tick in. I really get a good dose of dopamine. <laughs> yeah, I so, think it's, 
It's so important. And if you think about how you'd be for somebody else, say a friend, you'd have no hesitation in telling them well done or being really pleased for them. And it really shouldn't be any different for us. We speak to people in a more, in a kinder, more compassionate way than we speak to ourselves. Yeah. I, I, I always think to myself, it's, I, I always go back to this, this sort of analogy. It's like if we had a boss that spoke to us the way we spoke to ourselves then we'd quit <laughs> yeah yeah exactly how, yeah how can we master um, that self-talk um i think it is again about this idea of becoming more aware of it so lots of people say i'll see them they come in they do an assessment and they talk about themselves and and when we um finish the assessment and i kind of feed back i let them know you know you talked about yourself in this way or you called yourself this and you'd be surprised how many people don't even realise. So that that's just how they chat about things and talk about themselves. And even in conversations with other people, they put themselves down or kind of count themselves out of things. So again, it's becoming more aware of it. I think it can also be really helpful to think about whose voice it is, because often it's a voice that we've heard in our childhood. And perhaps it's from somebody who we wouldn't trust their opinion on anything else. Like we don't think highly of them. We don't, you know, think that they have a good opinion on any anything else and yet we still hold their view and just seeing where it comes from can make a big difference and thinking about the fact that you know if you thought about your closest you know the people who you're closest to in their your life and their view of you why aren't you counting their view more and just thinking about it in those terms and then the final part is bringing in more compassion and thinking about it as you're saying in terms of you know would I speak to a friend like this how would I think about this um, if I was talking to somebody else, and also recognising that compassion gets you better results. So it's not just that it makes you feel better. All the research shows that when you're more compassionate with yourself, you will do better because it is about seeing your strengths, it's about encouragement, and it's finding a way forward. And it's not saying that you're not going to make mistakes or that you know you, that you can't make improvements, but it's doing that from a place of... Um, a really encouraging stance, I suppose, in a place of strength and seeing the best in you. And what, you know, when you think about that, that's the person you want to have with you. Much nicer to have a cheerleader kind of follow you around and tell you where you're doing well and help you pick up the pieces if things go wrong than to have this kind of horrible bully. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that so much. I, I think we should dispel the myth that having this self critic in your head is in any way does it in any way lead to more productive outputs i read the happiness advantage by sean aker i think he's a positive psychologist and he did a load of research into happiness and the links that how it correlates to workplace success and yeah. what he found was that there is absolutely zero correlation between a critic in your mind negative self-talk and success and i think that that's that's a yeah. belief that people can hold on to that they yeah. can think that that by bullying themselves into tasks that it can it can drive them to more success and i think it's just so easy to see it when you imagine it's somebody else because it's so you just doesn't even take any research to know that if you're really horrible to somebody they're not going to do their best work or they're not going to feel kind of ready to go for it and like they're going to do a really good job and yet that's what we're constantly doing to ourselves. And even in terms of, you know, how you'd raise your children, if you've got children or if you imagine having children in the future, would you be constantly criticising them and telling them how badly they've done? Or would you be kind of helping them to grow and move on from mistakes and to also see all of their strengths and how well they can do? You know, it's just a when it comes to thinking about it for other people, it's just there's no question of how you do it. And it should be the same for us too. So let me try to link a few of these ideas in. So let me give an example now. So let's say that I have failed a university exam. So I think there's some, some key principles here. The, the feelings and all facts, the, yeah. uh, the self-compassion, and we'll say the, the overview and the, the reflection as well. So if I fail a university exam that I put barely any effort into it, and I come out and I'm going, oh, I, I knew it was the case. I'm, I'm, I'm not good enough. So should yeah. I then take a step back, be compassionate to myself and say, okay, you didn't work very hard for this. You, you didn't put the necessary hours in. 
you you didn't do X, you didn't do Y. Should I look at yeah. it in that context? Yeah, and I suppose with mistakes and failure, it's seeing that, you know, say you've done that exam, some people might have worked hard for it and you still might make it, you know, have, have a failure as a result of it. But just that that's a normal part of life, you know, that nobody gets through life without ever making a mistake or without ever failing. And that mistakes and failure aren't all bad because they build your resilience. You can learn from mistakes. And often it's kind of part of the process of success. And so when you have something go wrong, and, you know, in this example, you haven't put the work in, it is about kind of reflecting on what's happened. And rather than saying, okay, right, well, I just shouldn't bother trying again and seeing it as a full stop, it's saying, okay, well, what can I do differently next time? What can I take from this? And it's also seeing that it's horrible that when you fail something, but it's not the end of the world. You do survive, you can cope with it. And in many ways, it makes you stronger because you come back from it in a different way with more knowledge um, personally and in terms of what you need to do. Have you ever watched that J.K. Rowling commencement speech where she, where she talked a little bit about failure? No, I haven't seen it. Uh, I think in the commencement video, she says something like, the only way to not fail in life is if you live so cautiously that you never mm-hmm. attempt anything, and at which point you fail by default. Yeah, and, and I like I, that. I, yeah, and and I think I think that ties in, you know, beautifully for what you say for the people listening to see failure as see it as as a way you found that is proven that it do, it doesn't work. So you 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 you've you've sort of given yourself an advantage. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you, and that, you can and use it, it as a lesson. Yeah. Yeah, and that you have almost need to give yourself permission to fail. You know, so lots of people are going through life, right, I've got to get this right, I've got to get this right. But instead of saying, okay, I really want to go for X, it's going to be normal that to find the right way there, I might take a few wrong turns and to give yourself permission for that and to recognize that there's no right way. And in therapy, again, in terms of um, improvement and feeling better, I'd say the same, that it's not this kind of straight line graph for anything in life you don't go from you know not feeling so good or you know not not knowing much about something and just get better 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 it's this kind of very wiggly line of going up and down but actually that would give me more confidence that someone's learned and can manage any setbacks in the future if they've experienced a few on the way and got to know themselves better and got to know their kind of strengths and capabilities as a result of it what are the five types of imposter syndrome competence valerie young did a lot of research on imposter syndrome and she's also written a brilliant book on it and when she looked at it she looked at the different competence types and i think it's so interesting because you know when you read through her definitions it's so easy to relate to and it helps you again see that the different styles that you can have of imposter syndrome and again that helps you to kind of overcome it and she talks about the perfectionist which we've talked a lot about already Then the natural genius, which is somebody who kind of thinks that they should just be able to do things easily and it should come naturally to them. And when it doesn't, they feel like, oh, it means they're not good enough and there must be something wrong with them. Then there's the soloist, which is somebody who feels like it only counts if they've done it on their own. So if they've worked as part of a team or they've worked with somebody else, unless they've done the bulk of the work, they feel like they can't take ownership of the success. Um, And then the expert. And this is, this is another common one who feels like they need to know everything. So rather than kind of saying, okay, I can give this a go and I think I can be good at it and I've got the skills and framework already in place to make a good go of it, they feel like, oh, I don't know everything about this yet, so I'm not sure I'm going to be good enough. And the last one that she talks about is called the superwoman or man, and it's the perfectionist kind of on turbo charge, so feeling like you've got to be good in every area, you know, as a parent, friend, host, you know, working in the community, in your own work, and this kind of list of just having to do everything to the highest standard. And depending on your competence type um, depends on the triggers that you're likely to have. So when the expert doesn't know everything, they feel like an imposter. Or when the superwoman or man is not doing everything perfectly and kind of firing on all cylinders, they feel an imposter. So it's another kind of helpful tool to think about how it is in your own life. Are there any sort of self-talk phrases any 
maybe little tools or, or little tricks which, which you may have to, let's say I'm badly suffering with imposter syndrome and I'm going for a, for a, for a big job. What, what could my self-talk to myself be at that point? I think that, say, if you're preparing for something like that, it's really looking at the full picture of your life so that you can start to take on board all that you've done and have a sense of your achievements and your capabilities. And then it's a way to see your strengths. And, and a simple way to do that is to kind of note all that down. But also, if it's not for something specific, it's also a really good strategy just to start writing down each day the different things that have gone well, things you're pleased with. Because if you think about your that cognitive bias, it's tuned to what's not working. And it's almost like it needs to be redirected. So your attention widens and you're taking in on board all the good stuff you're doing too. And that means kind of that you are paying more attention to it. And then I encourage people to look back at it at the end of the week. So then you get to take it on board again. And also to talk to people about what they're doing. And to start kind of opening up a bit more so that there's a chance to celebrate your accomplishments, but also talk about the things you're worried about. Because generally when you're worried about something, the most common response isn't, well, that's a bit weird. It's much more likely to be, oh, that's exactly how I feel. Or when I did that, I felt exactly the same. And again, it's a chance to hear other people's experiences and to see how similar we all are rather than how different. And I think it's also in the longer term about accepting yourself and seeing that nobody is perfect. You know, we've all got flaws. We all have our insecurities and doubts, and that's part of what makes us human. And if we were completely sure of ourselves and, you know, we're kind of 10 out of 10 in every area, doing absolutely brilliantly on everything, um, I'm not sure that that would make you very relatable or would kind of, well, one, be realistic as an expectation, but two, um, it's just it's, that's just not how humans function, you know? So I'm getting the feeling that imposter syndrome is sort of paints a widely biased picture in our heads and one of the major things which i which i'm picking up is to look at things in a much larger context to instead of looking at the 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 micro look at the much bigger picture and weigh each one up and then you can even break it down as to why different things happen why yeah. You may have failed at, at, at a class test in year nine and, and suddenly 15 years on, you, you don't think that, that you're worthy of a position. Am, am I right in saying that we should look at things from a much larger perspective? I would say that it's more that we look at the full picture. So if you think about somebody who just concentrates on where they're falling short or what they're unhappy with, probably they're taking in 5% of their life rather than giving a fair view of the kind of full picture of how things are going. So with the examples you've given me of friends of yours who are really successful and doing really well, they're not looking at any of the things, whether it's on the micro level of the day-to-day or on this kind of bigger picture level. And one of the ways I think about it is that, um, you, you know, those kind of children's shape sort of toys where you've got a circle, you've got to put it through the circle hole, triangle, through the triangle hole. It's, it's almost like that for the good and bad things going on in your life or for the strengths that you see in yourself. If it's something good, it's got to be the right shape at the right time in the right hole. Whereas for anything negative, it's like there's a great big bucket catching it and you're taking it on board and believing it about yourself. And I suppose what I'm saying in terms of how you change your view is it, it needs to be fairer. It needs to take on board all of the good stuff and the time taken up with the good stuff and take on board what you want to improve on but not in this disproportionate way. So if, you know, 95% is going well, give 95% of your time to that and 5% is the bit that's not going well. So what would you, would you just pull out uh, a, an A4 paper, Evernote, and you would just sort of do like a, a column by column? What, what, would the, what would the process for that look like? I think that um, you can do it in terms of taking a historical view. So going right back and thinking about all the things that you've done well with and compiling, you know, like a big list of your experience, your qualifications, your good traits. I think that you can also do it in terms of thinking about your strengths. And so thinking about um, what you're most, you know, what you're best at. And if you're not very good at doing that by yourself, it can be helpful to ask other people because often they have a much better view of you. And then to collect information going forward that links to that so you start to see it for yourself. 
and then I also think you can do it as a as an ongoing exercise where you just kind of take a bit of time each day to reflect and to think about how you're doing um and that is a way to kind of build a new view of yourself based on the facts rather than based on your feeling that you're not very good at things what if i am a person that i've got huge goals and dreams but I may be very young in my life or I may have had some big failures and I don't have anything to go back to, to point to, but I want to get from A to, to, to B. What could I do to, say, maybe make those those steps? Is it small wins? Is it been building up momentum? What would you recommend? I think that in terms of when you're, say, a student, for example, it is another really common time when you experience imposter syndrome. And so, like you're saying, you don't have that same back catalogue to kind of look back over. But again, it's still saying that you've been accepted onto the course because they see potential in you. And in terms of having goals, it's great having goals, but it's important that they're not just this kind of thing far off in the distance that seems out of reach, but it's something you've got kind of concrete steps that you can work towards. And I think also it's having a more realistic view of how you're going to get there. So instead of saying, you know, I'm going to do brilliantly and I'm going to get there as quickly as possible, it's saying, okay, well, it's not just about getting to the goal. It's about the route I take to get there and acknowledging that you're going to make a few mistakes on the way, but that's actually really good experience and part of the process to recognize that when you get to the goal, it's not going to magically change everything, but it's about how you live your life on the way there. And to also think about the things that we've talked about in terms of um, doing it in a way that is sustainable and means that you can still enjoy your life. So if you do it as, you know, this kind of completely overworking and swinging between overwork and procrastination, working incredibly hard at times and then, you know, stopping and grinding to a halt, then again, it's going to make it much harder to, to get to the goal and far less pleasurable than if you set yourself you know, a goal and think about it in terms of, okay, well, I want to work really hard towards this. This is my aim. I'm going to do it as well as I can. But again, differentiating between perfect and doing well. And so it's also about, it's about what you take on board, but it's also about your kind of attitude to it and your expectations of yourself. And when your expectations are more realistic and you see, okay, there's going to be times when I do this, that I'm going to worry about it or think I'm doing the wrong thing or not feel like I'm up to it. Again, remembering that that's just human and everybody kind of doubts themselves at times but to still keep going you're going to have a much better route there than if you're expecting it all to go really well for you to do that kind of straight line graph of improvement getting better and and conquering your goals and also you're going to be able to live your life while you're doing it rather than putting everything on hold till you get there is there a daily practice which we could sort of undertake which would really help to rewire those neural pathways could it be maybe constructive journaling could it be anything which would really sort of help us our listeners who have listened to this and they've got some amazing ideas from today what could they do to start putting this into to practice today yeah i think a really simple thing is to start writing each day and whilst we're programmed to see threat because of that fight or flight response we talked about earlier we can change that pathway and with practice and um, kind of consistency, when you're looking at the things that are going well, it can make a huge difference. And if you think about that within the context that we've talked about in terms of writing and doing it from a compassionate stance and thinking about your strengths and where you're doing well, but also how you want to improve and kind of just keeping some kind of daily log of that, I, I think it would make a big difference to moving forward because you're kind of keeping everything in check, but you're also supporting yourself as you do that in a really nice way. I've absolutely loved speaking to you today, and I've just got three questions left to wrap this absolutely phenomenal interview up. The first question is, are there any societal rules or norms that you love to break? Um, I was thinking about this one and um, it made me think of the fact that I have this kind of saying that I say to myself where I say, you know, always reserve the right to change your mind. And by that, I mean, if I'm trying something new or I want to do something, then I just say to myself, okay, I'm going to try it. But if I don't like it, I can stop. 
And I think lots of a lot of the time people say, you know, I'm going to do this. If I said I'm going to do it, then I've got to keep doing it. Um, or that they are kind of, you know, if they've told everybody about how they're going to do this new thing, then they stop doing it. It's like embarrassing. Whereas for me, I just think, well, it puts less pressure on me to get started. But also, if I don't like it, what's the point of me continuing just because I've told everybody that I'm going to? Again, it's almost like the, you know, kind of making a mistake. It's just new information and you can kind of change your mind and go back on it. Um, and so I suppose that's what it made me think of when you talked about it. And that I have tried lots of things and then I've stopped doing that. But I don't see that as a bad thing. I just see that as part of finding the things that I enjoy and also that, you know, we change massively. That's why it's so important to kind of reevaluate and update our beliefs and our expectations of ourselves and other people. So if you're just trying something, you should be allowed to change your mind. I love that so much. <laughs> I love that. I'm, I'm going to go away for a second. I'm going to write that down because I thought that was that was brilliant. Thank My next you. question is, uh, are there any books which have greatly impacted your life? I thought this was another difficult question to narrow it down to one, but oh, one that I've more, read recently. More, oh, I, I, I've got one that I can <laughs> highly recommend that I've read recently, and it's called The Choice. Have you heard of it? It's by Edith Egger, and choice, it's an amazing it. book. It's about her um, experience she, and her story of the Holocaust and what happens when you survive it. And it is a heartbreaking story at the start and a real reminder of that period of time and history. But the amazing thing about it is it's filled with hope. And she actually becomes a clinical psychologist afterwards. And in the book, she says her own experiences. And it's all about the choices that you can make. So even when something so unimaginable happens and something so terrible happens, that you still have a choice in how you move forward. Um, and it's just beautifully written, hugely kind of thought provoking and so humbling. And it's just a wonderful reminder of what we're capable of as, as humans. So, so that's my one to recommend. The choice. And how do I, how do I spell your name? Um, it's e Edith and then E-G-E-R is their name. E-G-E-R. I will add that to my good read list. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Our last question is, if you could give a short but impactful message to hypothetically every person on the planet, what would your message be? My motto is that what you do every day makes the biggest difference. And um, when you think about it, often people get stuck into this trap that when they you know, achieve an amazing goal or when they buy the next house or when they meet their partner or when they have a baby, everything's going to be good. You know, and that that's what they need to make everything OK. Whereas the reality is that those things don't make as big a difference as you think. And that it's the things that you do every day that make the biggest difference. And when you think about it, we're the product of all of our choices, but especially the small things you do each day. So rather than putting your life on hold and saying, you know, when I get there, I'll make time for friends or fun or, um, you know, the important things in my life. It's thinking, actually... Why is it going to magically change when I get there? What can I do today that can make a difference? And that it can be as small as sitting down for a cup of tea in the middle of the day, you know, making time for friends, phoning somebody you care about, and that those things are what lift your mood. And when you have things every day, it's in a more consistent way that you lift your mood. Um, and that actually puts you in a much better position to reach your goals and do the other things that you want to. So it's almost coming at it from a different direction. Where can our listeners connect with you and where can they go to get the book? So the book is on, you know, it's kind of online for places like Amazon, WH Smith, kind of all, all the bookshops that you'd expect. And I know it's in store as well. So um, hopefully fairly easy to get hold of. And then um, I'm on social media as Dr. Destiny. So that's another place that we can, people can find me. And... Everything will be linked down below. Just swipe up on this episode and there will be full links to Jessamy's social media, the book on Amazon. It will be linked everywhere. And I can say that this is one of the best books that I have read this year. I have I was on such a rut of reading bad books, but this one was, I thought it was fantastic. So thank you so much for bringing light to such a, a real difficult question and and you know you should be exceptionally proud of the work which you're doing and it must give you so much meaning 
Thank you. And thank you so much for having me on the show. It's been such a pleasure to chat with you about it all.